All right, everyone, everybody that's on the call, I just want to remind you that we are recording this um, and we're going to post it to the MAS uh, YouTube channel. And I'm going to turn it over to Steve. Sounds good. Thank you, Mark. Anyway, yeah, I'm Steve Emmerich. I'm the MES membership coordinator. And I used to do these things in person about three times a year, but kind of COVID threw that into the uh, into the hopper. So we're going to be doing a web session today. Uh, because we have a fairly small group, we can, uh, if you have any questions come up, uh, you can either use the chat and Mark and uh, and Matt will relay it on to me, or you can just uh, unmute your audio and pipe up and uh, and ask the question. But we'll try to cover everything in a fairly logical form. And here we go. So what we'll do is we'll start with the agenda. Um, basically, welcome. Again, I'm Steve Emmert. I've been a member of the MES since 2001. So I guess 20 years now. Good colleague, time flies. Um, in the past, I've been uh, vice president for, I think, one term and a uh, secretary for about a term and a half, maybe two terms, I don't remember exactly what, currently the membership coordinator, and also a member of the Cherry Grove Committee. So uh, been around a fair amount of time. We also have on the on the line here, Mark Job, who's our president, the person that opened the call, and also Matt Dunnan, our treasurer. So um, we'll uh, keep with that. So getting on to the Organization, oh, let me back up here. Um, so basically what we're gonna go through is different sections. Um, talk about the organization first, because uh, it's a large club with a little over 600 members right now. So we have to have a fairly decent organization to support that. Then we'll get into the observing sites and facilities and talking about star parties, talk about the public observing nights um, and basically all things observing related. And then uh, talk about some of the other things after that that we can do beyond observing. Uh, the, the monthly meetings, other communication types, things on the website, uh, the discussion list, email list, uh, the message service, things like that, uh, publish, well, uh, pub yeah, good grief, anyway. Uh, publications, that's the word I was trying to think of. And uh, and then move on to special interest groups, talk about how to find out when we're doing things that we're doing, and then uh, wrap it up after that. So that's the general overview. So the organization, we have a six person MES executive board. We'll talk about those guys in a second. In addition to that, we have individual site managers and the observing site committees to take care of the various properties we have. In addition to that, we have a lot of other functions, uh, special interest group leaders, and a few other functions like that. So getting into some of those, uh, looking at the MES board, here's a picture of, uh, of our current board. So Mark Job in the upper left, the president, uh, he's online here, uh, Vice President Baltz, and uh, below that, Trina Johnson, who's our sec current secretary, Matt Dunham, who's also online here, is the treasurer, and then two board members at large, Conrad and Gunnar. Um, as I said on right here, that we hold elections every year, and basically each column is elected each year. So the column on the left was just elected. Uh, so Mark just came into the job this year, and that wasn't intended as a pun, um, succeeding uh, Dave Faulkner. And uh, Trina re-upped re and uh, Conrad got elected. So at the end of this year, Vaults and Matt and Gunner will, will come up for election. Now, the only thing that's unusual about elections are the uh, President is limited by the uh, by the Constitution to two consecutive terms, and then he has to give it up, and he can come back, which has happened with some a number of uh, past presidents. So, otherwise, the other members of the board can can uh, continue indefinitely if they want. And I know the treasurer is a hard job. And uh, years past, I think we had some treasurers on there for five or six terms. So, uh, Matt, we're hoping you're going to hang in there for a long time. We'll see. Well, it kind, of, yeah, it kind of makes sense. Once you get everything figured out, then you want to stick with it for a while. Exactly. So anyway, uh, there's a lot of way to communicate to people, but as I show on the slide there, to send an email to the MAS board, you can use the mail address, uh, masboard at mnastro.org. So moving from, whoops, uh, yeah, sorry about that. Moving from the, uh, from the board, uh, some of the observing site managers we have. So um, upper left-hand corner uh, for the Joseph J. Casby Observatory at Bellwin, uh, John Heyman's the primary person that, who takes care of that. And also because of the proximity, John also takes care of uh, Metcalf Observing Field, which is our oldest observing site. Uh, they're both located in Afton. Moving from uh, that to the upper right, 
uh, Cherry Grove down south, about 20 miles south of Cannon Falls. Uh, Vic Heiner heads up the committee, uh, which I'm a member of, as it turns out, uh, taking care of Cherry Grove, where we're going to be doing a little bit of uh, work this year. Unfortunately, those trees that you see in the background are gone, so we're going to replace them with a fence. Um, down in the lower right hand corner, Long Lane Conservation Center, and we'll talk about all of these sites individually, but LLCC is our darkest sky site and Ken Hugel is the site manager for that. In the middle, um, for Eagle Lake Observatory in, um, in uh, Western Carver County at uh, Baylor Regional Park. Uh, it's our largest site and it's our outreach site. So Merle Hiltner takes care of all of the facilities and Lila Blinkman takes care of the uh, program uh, direction because we do have a lot of things going on besides just plain old member observing at that location. So a lot of work of, uh, involved in uh, taking care of Eagle Lake. Uh, in addition to the sites, we have a lot of other functions going on. So uh, some of those are the ALCOR, Astronomical League Coordinator, and he's also the Observing Special Interest Group Chairperson, Jerry Jones. Um, the Loner Telescope sits under the purview of the Vice President, but Anton Gregory is the person that's generally taking care of all of those right now. Uh, Father Brown uh, is the editor of the Gemini Newsletter, and we'll talk about all of these things in detail a little bit later. We have a pretty good web presence, if you have I'm sure you've noticed. The uh, web committee uh, works on that thing, and Merle does a good chunk of the work in that. We also have email communication, which kind of preceded the website and preceded the uh, the discussion forums, which are part of the website, and Bob takes care of those lists. Um, Ahmed Rita takes care of the monthly meeting programs and uh, does a great job of getting outside speakers for our monthly programs. Uh, and again, uh, in addition to her duties as the ELO program coordinator, Lila does the outreach, and we'll talk about that. And then finally, you've got me and my ugly mug there on the bottom uh, as membership coordinator. So with all of these people, how do you find us? Well, fortunately, it's on the website. Um, you can see in the middle of the page here, we've got MN Astro about us, blah, 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 is the URL. But to navigate to it, you come from the home page and it's about us, and then contact the MAS leadership and committees. Uh, with that, you'll see the information that some of which you saw on the previous slide and also that you see on this slide, just the listing of everybody. Down toward the bottom of it, if you want to communicate to any of the groups, uh, we have a web form for email communication. So put in your name and your email, uh, which obviously are both required to get an email contact back. Uh, type in your, your subject and basically use that web form to create the email to whoever it is you need to, to contact, whether it's one of the board members or a site leader or any of the other uh, function leaders. So let's move on to observing because uh, after all, that's what astronomy, the hobby of astronomy is all about, it's observing. So we're gonna talk about the observing sites and star parties and public nights and things like that. So taking a look at the observatories that we have, we basically have all four uh, cardinal, uh, cardinal uh, points of the compass covered. So out on the west, about a half an hour west of the Twin Cities is Eagle Lake Observatory. Uh, on the right, we have Metcalf Field and Joseph J. Casby Observatory, both in Afton, so they're about 15, 20 minutes outside of the Twin Cities. Looking down south, we have Cherry Grove, which is about 20 miles south of Cannon Falls, or conversely, about 25 miles toward the Twin Cities from Rochester. And that used to be our, our darkest sky site, being the farthest away, until we struck up a relationship with Long Lake Conservation Center up in Aiken, Minnesota, which is way up north. So it's two to two and a half hours north of the Twin Cities. So that one is currently our darkest sky site and uh, really, really good skies up there. So first let's talk about uh, all of the sites individually. So the Eagle Lake Observatory uh, started out just as Onan Observatory, which you'll see in a couple of seconds. It is in Western Carver County, uh, located in Baylor Regional Park. And that's about three miles north of Norwood, Young America. It consists of the Sylvia Casby Observer Observatory, which is that dome on the upper right of this picture, the hotspot classroom, uh, which is a air conditioned and heated classroom, so it makes a nice facility for lectures. We also stream our uh, cameras, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, so you can actually see astro views on the screen inside the uh, 
the hotspot classroom uh, when necessary. And uh, down at the bottom, uh, you see the, the hotspot classroom on the left, Sylvia Casbury Observatory on the right, and in the center is the Onan Observatory, which is the first facility that was built out there. Um, Onan Observatory was built in the late 1900s, like 1998, 1999, was first opened in 2000, and then kind of publicly opened and dedicated in 2001, which actually, that was the very first place I ever went to for the club personally. Inside the Sylvia Casby Observatory, we've got a uh, really good collection of equipment. We have the eight inch TMB refractor, which is that one, uh, long refractor in the center. There's also a Takahashi Muon Dalkirkham telescope, which is the kind of a greenish bluish one, uh, the large one on the, on the right. That's also accompanied by a Stellar, stellar View 102 refractor. And that's all on a astrophysics mount. So a bunch of good equipment in there. And then when you move to Onan Observatory, we have quite a few different platforms because it's a little bit bigger. On the left, you see the 16-inch uh, Mead LX200. So that's a large visual scope. It's also accompanied with a couple of smaller scopes on top and bottom. In the middle, we see the imaging platform. Now, all of our platforms are based on uh, Celestron C14s. Well, the imaging and the visual platform are both based on Celestron C14s. That's the larger tube, the larger dark gray tube in the middle. Uh, the visual platform, in addition to the C14, has a Stellarview 152 refractor and a Teleview 102 refractor. And the Teleview is equipped with Coronado solar filters, so it's a solar scope as well. Um, and I think I'm looking at the imaging platform while talking about the visual platform. But anyway, that was all the visual platform I was talking about. Um, and that's on a Paramount mount. So it's a high-end computerized mount, very stable, um, really good equipment. The imaging platform in the middle, that's another C14. That one's uh, equipped also with the Takahashi TOA-130, a Takahashi FSQ-106, and a Teleview 76, and that one also has a solar filter on it. And if you look at that picture, all of those have cameras on the backside. Um, I'm not an expert on all of the cameras, but uh, anyway, I'm not going to get into the details on the cameras on them. But those give us the ability to uh, show on monitors inside the Onan Observatory, and also, as I mentioned before, run through uh, some cabling into the hotspot classroom and project them on the screen inside the classroom as well. So that's what's really nice about this set of equipment is you don't have to just line up, you know, in a big long line of people to get a little peep through the eyepiece, but also if you're uh, for the handicapped or for people that just don't want to wait for it, or maybe it's kind of hard to figure out what am I seeing through this little eyepiece. You get a great view of stuff directly on the, uh, on the uh, TV screen from the thing. And they're all, uh, they've been upgraded from the original ones, which were, you know, standard definition television from years gone by, but they're all high definition screens now. Steve, could you go back, uh, Sylvia, and uh, mention the Lunt on the left? Oh, okay. Um, can you talk about that? Because I really don't know that much about the Lunt on the left. No, I was actually hoping you would. Uh... Oh. Mark, can you uh, fill in for us? Yes, absolutely. So that's a, that's a five-inch uh, refracting telescope that has uh, solar filters in it, built into it. And so it's a, that one is not pressure tuned. So um so that's uh, you know so that, that we use that for uh, uh, solar viewing and uh, it's a tremendous scope. I remember the first time I looked through it. After I walked away, I went, I have to sell my four inch because I want five inch now because it's incredible. Um, and it has the ability to for us to be able to change out eyepieces so we can zoom right in and magnify uh, a, a, a solar flare or a uh, or a sunspot. So it's pretty cool. Does it also work with prominences or is that a Yeah, that's what I meant. Solar, oh. solar flare, prominence. Yep. Okay. You can zoom right in and, you know, uh, by increasing the power of the, of the eyepiece and, and, you know, look just at, just at the flare. So it's okay. pretty awesome. Yeah. And I... For any, anybody that's fairly new, um, there's two different types of solar 
filters. Uh, there's hydrogen alpha. It's a red solar filter, and that's what they were talking about with prominences. You can see the these loops or prominences on the on the edge of the of the sun. And then there's the cheaper ones that most of us have in our kit. You know, the black and white. You know, just a, a white filter that makes it makes the sun look either white or kind of orangish, in depending on what the filter is. But these are all equipped with the red hydrogen alpha filters to to be able to see the prominences. Somebody said, ask something. Oh, yep. If I could raise my hand. This is uh, Merle. Oh, hey. Um, that is a 152. That's a six inch uh, lump solar scope. Okay. Very and, good. Thank you. Merle, that's right. That's why I wanted to sell my four inch. Yep. And uh, we also have um, another solar um, uh, filter on the uh, in Sylvia, which is the uh, hydro or the uh, Herschel wedge. Uh, so we can actually use the eight inch scope uh, as a uh, solar uh, scope as well. So obviously um, you don't need to have an eight inch scope or larger for looking at the sun because it puts out a lot of light. So you don't need a lot of ap aperture for the light gathering capability. But what it does do is gives you a lot more resolution capability because the, the theoretical maximum resolution is also based on the diameter of the telescope or the aperture of the telescope. Right. And if we ever get a sunspot again, it'll, they look really <laughs> virtual wedge. We're supposed to start getting those sometime soon this year, I think. Okay. okay. Yeah. yeah. And the reason I wanted to mention is just because I think that's something you really want to make sure you see when you go out to ELO. Yeah, definitely. And also, since you mentioned uh, you can switch out eyepieces and look through different eyepieces, that visual platform on the right of the uh, Onan Observatory collection, that has a turret on it. So we have five eyepieces on the turret. So you can quickly move from a uh, wide angle view to a closer view and, and try out different eyepieces. Um, also at Onan Observatory, uh, we have a portable telescope, if you can call a 20 inch obsession that when it's standing up straight at its zenith, it's probably about 12 feet tall. Um, we have the 20 inch obsession uh, truss Dob Dobsonian telescope. And that one's equipped with Servocat and Argo Navis, so it is a computerized telescope as well. Um, and we use that one for just generally playing around out on the field. Uh, a couple other other views of the system. So the imaging platform in the upper right, upper left rather, uh, just a somebody uh, at a star party showing all three telescope platforms in own an observatory in the upper right, and then an overview of the facility on the bottom of this, this picture. So how do we get there? Uh, basically, it's about a half hour west of the Twin Cities. Depending on where you're coming from, you may want to elect uh, Highway 7 out to County Road 33 or Highway 5 out to County Road 33. Um, I used to take those personally because I'm in the northeast corner of the city. So I thought, well, gee, I'll take a more northern route. But a few years ago, Highway 212 um, has more portions of it uh, turned into a four lane divided highway. And so it's a lot faster for anybody coming out. So it's pretty much a given, uh, pretty much default that you're gonna take 212 out to Norwood Young America and then hang a right and go up on County Road 33 up to uh, Baylor Regional Park. And uh, a map on the right-hand side there, how to get there. And of course, all of this information is available on the website. Um, one thing to note is in the past, uh, we don't charge for entrance fees. We do take donations, of course, uh, from the public, but uh, we never charged for star parties or public observing nights at Eagle Lake Observatory, but the county used to uh, charge parking there. Uh, fortunately, uh, a year ago, December, they got rid of that and it's free access now. So basically you can come in uh, without, any, uh, without any cost for the public. Um, to become a member of uh, the NELO uh, key holder, basically, we've, as you can see, we've got a lot of equipment there and it takes a lot of time to get trained on it. So what we do ask to, in order for all MES members, anyone that's a member in good standing is able to uh, become a key holder. You have to become trained on the observatories and the equipment. So learn how to use the equipment, how to open and close on an observatory, learn how to open and close Sylvia Casby Observatory and the hotspot classroom, how to disarm and arm the alarm systems and things like that. And we uh, also ask uh, that people commit to assisting at least twice per year uh, out at ELO, whether it's simply facilities maintenance, helping clean up stuff or uh, maintain things, um, 
I think we're coming close to the end of the railing project. Uh, we're open talk. Uh, well, we'll probably don't need to delve into that right now, but we've got a number of projects going on all the time, improving the facilities. So either work like that or attending and being becoming a volunteer at the public star parties. Uh, the benefits you get from becoming a key holder, basically you can access that place and use the equipment at any time, just don't break it. Uh, uh, so you can access the observatory's equipment anytime, whether it's you know helping out at the public star parties or, or other events, or uh, scheduling an impromptu star party, or uh, just scheduling a reservation and going out there. One thing to note, though, is the park does have a gate at the front, and that gate closes at 10 p.m., and uh, it does require a combination to, uh, to enter to get in. You don't have to have the combination to get back out, but you do have to get back, get in using a combination after 10 o'clock, and once you become a key holder, access to that information is on the ELO key holder form, or if you can't find it there and you are a key holder, you can contact Merle. Um, so uh, it's information about uh, key holder requirements. Um, since you're there, Merle, did I miss anything major on that or anything you want to add? Um, yes, the, um, the access to the park itself, or I should say the access to the observatory grounds uh, are open to all MAS members. So you don't have to be a key holder to go out and use uh, the plaza for observing on your own. Um, so if you're a member and just want access uh, to use your own equipment, uh, give me an email. Um, otherwise, yeah, the, the facilities you need to ha uh, have key holder access to. Okay, good point. Thank you. Yeah, and we do have outlets on the outside of the observatory so you can plug in equipment if you have to. Okay. So a little bit about the public observing nights, because I've mentioned those uh, a little bit. Um, as I said earlier, uh, the Eagle Lake Observatory facility, well, actually just the Onan, uh, came into existence around the year 2000, and we and it is our primary uh, public outreach location. So we hold the public observing nights basically at the uh, first quarter moon and the third quarter moon weekend as in tonight we'll be having one. And those are open to the public, uh, you know, because that's really the whole idea behind it. Um, it is, all of the events are listed on our schedule. We'll talk about schedules and how to find that in a little bit. Now, the interesting thing about Eagle Lake Observatory public nights, normally, and I'll get into the details because of COVID in a second, but normally they're held rain or shine, unless it's really severe weather and, you know, we've got to batten down the hatches. Uh, but what we do is, uh, we open it up at seven o'clock and end at 10 o'clock. Uh, and it's always open, even if it's cloudy, we'll have tours of the observatory, probably some slideshows and things like that. So because of that, we do require that for public nights, we have to have at least a few volunteers available and in attendance at Eagle Lake. Um, and of course, in the summertime, you know, 10 o'clock is pretty early. That's basically just starting astronomical twilight at that time. So if it's a nice clear night, MES members may elect to stay later if the skies are clear uh, during the sign. And again, as I mentioned before, we don't charge a fee to the public uh, for the attendance, but uh, donations are certainly accepted because it does take a lot of money to ensure and maintain the equipment. Um, actually, I think I need, forgot to update this slide on the key holder training. Uh, Oh yes, it is still to be determined. I grabbed this screenshot from the ELO keyholder training. This is where it's located for the forum word MAS operations, Eagle Lake Observatory discussions. Uh, you can break in if you want to, Merle, if, if you have scheduled it, but as of yesterday or a couple of days ago when I grabbed the screenshot, uh, it's still to be determined. But you can see training normally starts at noon and uh, goes for quite a while down to supper, uh, supper time. So there's a lot of equipment, a lot of facilities in there. And so it does take quite a while to get trained there. And again, um, you know, new members, come on in, do it. Uh, if you're an existing member and you need a refresher course, come on and do it. You do have to get um, signed up for the, for the training because you can imagine uh, we can only handle a certain number of people uh, clustering around Merle when he does the training for that. Um, moving on to public star parties. Um, Unfortunately, again, because of COVID-19, uh, normally 
in normal years, you can just attend, look on the schedule, find out when a public star party is happening and attend it. Because of the COVID-19, we're limited to the number of people that uh, can can come to the site at one time uh, and we have to be masked up and stuff. So you do have to sign up. So here are the current rules because of uh, COVID that uh, Merle has set it up that we'll have two different time slots, one from seven o'clock to 8.30 and another time slot from 8.30 to 10 o'clock, for example, for the one tonight. Uh, and there are 25 reservations for the first slot and 25 reservations for the second slot. Um, the one for tonight is actually filled right now. And everyone has to read and sign a liability waiver. Basically, if I get infected, it wasn't, you know, it was because somebody did their own thing. And you have to have that with you. Um, because it's the the COVID thing and everything, uh, we'll cancel it if it's cloudy, cloudy, but I think tonight is gonna be good. But I have, you know, keep that in mind for future uh, public star parties tonight or beyond tonight rather later this year. And all of this information is in the form topic, which the big long URL that's at the bottom. And this is what it actually looks like on the on the on the uh, form. So in addition to the public nights, which happen again on the first and the first quarter and third quarter moon typically, or at least the weekend closest to those, we have an, a regional multi-day star party at Eagle Lake, um, Camping with the Stars. This is, I forgot, it's probably about the ninth annual now. I don't remember which, which one this is. We've been doing it for quite a few years, probably about the 14th. 10th or 11th, 14th. It's right there in front of me. Right Thank there. you. <laughs> I can't read my own slides. Anyway, the 14th annual Camping with the Stars, and it's a multi-day thing, and we do a, a lot of good stuff. It's basically camping. We use the field, and uh, people can, of course, camp in Baylor Regional Park as well uh, and have a lot of activities, uh, barbecues, uh, drawings, and uh, and other prizes. So uh, that is one of the times you do actually have to pay to do something to come in there because of the all of the activities scheduled. Um, that's about it for, for Eagle Lake right now. Let's move down south to Cherry Grove. Here are a couple of pictures of Cherry Grove. And as I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, the upper left hand corner and upper, well, couple of those pictures, you see some trees on the north side of it. Unfortunately, those are gone. We'll be replacing those trees that are gone with a fence later this year to gain back some uh, light shielding from the road. But uh, it basically consists of that tool shed on the left and a warming house in the center, that white building. And then the observatory itself is a roll off roof observatory, uh, the larger structure on, on the right side there. Uh, in that we house uh, the lower left corner of this picture is the 24-inch uh, Starmaster truss daub. It's a computerized with a servo cat and uh, Argo Navis digital setting circles. It's a 24-inch reflector. Um, and that one we haul out and, and uh, people use it on, on the concrete pad. Uh, overview of that site, uh, this is from the south, what is that, southeast corner looking to the northwest. Uh, so that fence there is on the left, uh, on the west side of the property, and there's a house behind those trees to the left. And again, those trees to the right are gone. They'll be replaced with fence that's similar to that one uh, that's on the west side right now. Um, lower left, we're an interior of the uh, warming house. It's got uh, both warming and cooling and a refrigerator and, uh, and a coffee pot and a microwave oven. So the basic uh, amenities. And then on the lower right hand corner is the uh, roll off roof with its roof rolled back. It's used for storage for the bad as well as two telescope uh, mounts on the front side on the south side. So that's why you only see it uh, pulled halfway back. Here's a aerial view of the facility again um, that was taken early last year before the trees came down. So um, what we have down there, um, well, first let's talk about how to get there. So again, it's about 20 miles south of Cannon Falls. So typically people go to the southeast corner of the cities and take the Highway 52 exit and go down past Cannon Falls and then take uh, Goodhue County 1 straight down south until you can't go any farther and there's Cherry Grove. It's also possible, but it's a little bit longer to go down 35 to Faribault and come across, go through Kenyon and come down to the place. Uh, typically going through Cannon Falls and taking County 1 is the fastest way. 
Uh, we do have keyholder access there. The training on it is nowhere near as extravagant as we have for the uh, for Eagle Lake, but we have uh, a couple of different levels of combination quote key holder. Uh, you can, if you want to just use the field uh, without getting inside anything, you don't need key holder access. You just, you know, come on down. We've got outlets outside. We've got some uh, concrete pads to put telescopes on outside, stuff like that, and, uh, and uh, outhouse access. If you need to get the warming house, if you want to have that plus the warming house, uh, we have uh, one combination that's just provides warming house access. But uh, if you want access to the observatory for using either that bad that I showed, uh, excuse me, big aperture Dobsonian is the nickname for the uh, 24 inch Starmaster. Uh, or inside the observatory, we have a 16 inch Mead LX200, uh, similar to the one that's out at Eagle Lake. And also we have an imaging platform with a couple of other scopes, uh, a Takahashi refractor and a plane wave reflector. Um, so if you want to use any of those things, the the imaging platform, the bat, or the 16 inch, you get go through training and then get uh, a different code that gives you access to everything. Um, so to take a look at some of the equipment we've got there, this is a picture of the Mead LX200. Uh, it's a 16 inch LX200 uh, classic. So a really good old fashioned machine that works really well. Happy with that guy. On the right is the uh, imaging platform and I, uh, you have to go through some specific training for the imaging platform. Uh, Doug, Doug Neverman is leading up that imaging training. <clears throat> but on that platform, it's a Takahashi re uh, refractor, which is the white tube on the lower part of it, and a plane wave. Oh, it's a reflector. It's not just a Newtonian reflector. I believe it's... It's a dull Kirkham. It, it is a dull Kirkham. I was going to say that, but I didn't want to say it without knowing for sure. But anyway, a couple of really good systems. Now we also have a laptop that's connected up to it and the cameras are connected up to it. So basically, once you get trained on it, all you have to do is, uh, in order to use it, is bring a flash card as, as a minimum set of equipment to take your images and, and pull them off. Uh, so it's really uh, intended to for personal imaging uh, after getting trained. In addition to those two platforms inside the observatory, we have a couple of things for just general, uh, you know, uh, casual observing. Inside the warming house, we have stored a Mead 10 inch daub and an eight inch Jamel daub. Uh, both of those are first come first serve. They are equipped with, you know, the typical uh, PLOS LI pieces and some, uh, the uh, planisphere and the, and the charts and things and, uh, and the and the red um, flashlight. So those are basically first come first serve for people that may not have their own scope or maybe their own scope dued up or whatever they want. And they can just grab one and pull it out on the field and use it. Also inside there, we have a pair of uh, 20 by, uh, yeah, 20, 20 power by 80 millimeter uh, binoculars. And that blue thing that they're pointing down at is actually a front surface mirror. So you don't have to crick your neck. So you can take that out onto the field, take the, uh, take that blue cover off of it. And then by tilting the, the mirror, uh, you can get different looks at the different parts of the sky. So a pretty cool little piece of equipment. Again, that's a, a first come first serve for anybody that wants to use it in pulling it out of the observatory. Um, so I talked a little bit about this, but let me get back into the key holder training for Cherry Grove. Uh, so we have a couple of different levels. Again, if you want, if you want to come down and not have access to anything, just come on down. You can still get in the outhouse. Um, or if you need the facilities and you want to be able to get into the warming house to get at the, you know, warm up or cool down, depending on what part of the year it is, and get at the microwave and junk like that, you can get a combination for just that. And training on that is like 10, 15 minutes, if that. Um, and then in addition to that, then for getting access to the observatory, either get trained on the imaging system. Uh, or the LX200 or the 24 inch star, star master. So uh, all three of those things are housed in the observatory. So you need that. Um, in the past, we simply held, you know, in normal years, we hold those training uh, basically on demand every star party. Uh, but unfortunately with COVID, we're not quite going down there as often. So uh, we're asking people to request training uh, on the discussion forum. And also the imaging training is a little bit more involved. So uh, that is advertised and Doug sets up a, a training session 
matter of fact, there's going to be one next weekend if there's if it's not cloudy, uh, and you sign up on the CGO discussion forum and uh, and get trained on that system. Okay, so that's a quick overview of uh, Cherry Grove. Moving up to our darkest sky site, Long Lake Conservation Center, about two and a half hours up uh, north of the metro area in Aiken County, which has 15,000 people and one stoplight in the whole county. Uh, LLCC basically is a environmental education outreach area, as well as being a community center for Aiken County. But their primary goal is, or their primary mission rather, is that they do environmental education for grade school kids. Uh, typically, fifth graders come in, they bring in a busload of kids from somewhere in the Twin Cities, any of the school districts that subscribe to them, and they stay from uh, Monday morning through Wednesday noon, and it's a full immersion training where they go into the woods. Uh, you'll see some pictures what LLCC, as its name implies, has a lake. It also has a peat bog. It has, also has woods. It does orienteering. It does a lot of stuff. So kids will come in from Monday noon or Monday morning to Wednesday noon, and they have bunk beds for them and everything for night. And then they get packed up and head home. And then when Wednesday noon through Friday night, another set of kids come in and do the same thing. So because of that primary uh, primary goal for Long Lake Conservation Center, we're limited in when we can go there. So it's only during scheduled star parties. So uh, uh, what we have is the MES members and visitors we can only come during the scheduled star parties because there's a lot of other things going on at LLCC at other times. We do have to get parking permits. It's just based, uh, basically a piece of paper you throw on your on your dashboard. That has to be obtained from Ken Hugel or one of the other LLCC committee members. Um, we have combination access to a garage. We call it an observatory. Basically, it's a garage that houses uh, both a 30-inch and a 25-inch obsession. We'll show those things in a little bit. Uh, during the normal star parties, um, because it's so far away, two and a half hours away, normal star parties at the other sites are either Friday night or Saturday night, and it's just one night and you go back home. Well, it's a long way up there, so let's stay for two nights with, if we can. So star parties at LLCC are scheduled for both Friday night and Saturday night, which means you got to have a place to bunk. So this uh, picture on the upper left is showing the Markham House where we have bunks available. Um, basically, it's the same bunks that those kids use during their sessions. Uh, their environmental sessions. So there's a lower and an upper bunk and each room has eight bunks in it total. So we're adults, so we typically pick the bottom one. So a bunk room is good for four people. Uh, they're just bunks with mattresses, but the rooms do have a uh, full washing facility. So they have toilet, sink and uh, shower facilities. Basically, you can bring your own um, your own towels and amenities and uh, and a sleeping bag to sleep on and a pillow. And then you're you're good for it. Um, in Steve, the yes, sir. Before you go too far, um, I, I was going to get to that. <laughs> we're, we're working on a new deal with LLCC. Um, the bunkhouse may not be free anymore. Um, oh, interesting. Okay, but you know, we're still in negotiation, so we don't know where it's going to go yet. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw that out there that it may not be free anymore. Okay, um, but it will be. The fee will not be huge. I mean, it's it's not the Marriott. So, and, and, and they know that, but they need, uh, because of COVID and all their cleaning requirements, you know, they, they got to spend a lot more time cleaning the room uh, after we leave. So that's why they want a little money for labor. That's all. We've been sloppy then because it used to be that we had to police ourselves afterwards and leave it in the same condition that we came in. Yeah. But the thing is, is they have to make sure that it's clean to the Minnesota state health requirements for basically a hotel. Okay, good point. I didn't think of that part. Also, weren't you saying, Mark, that uh, the status of LLCC is a little bit in limbo because nope. normally they have that education staff? No limbo at all. We, for 2021, they are welcoming us with open arms. And uh, if it's clear, we get the place. Um, and there's going to be, you know, if it's clear every weekend that we have scheduled we'll have full run of the place every weekend. They're not, we just had a meeting last week. So this, it's, it's going to, it's going to be pretty awesome for 2021. We don't know where it's going to go for the future, but, um, and they're, as of yesterday, they, they, they supposedly have hired a new 
program director there. So they're coming back up. They're gearing up. It's, Excellent. Okay. It'll be as good or better than the old days. Okay, great. Yeah, what I was alluding to within Limbo was because of COVID, they stopped all of those programs that I talked about. And of course, they didn't need staff beyond the maintenance staff for it. So it's good to hear that they're staffing back up again. That's great to hear. Yeah, they uh, they did lose a bunch of money, which is obvious uh, because the schools weren't coming. Um, and the news is, is that Aiken County must have had some money in the treasury and they paid all their bills. They've remodeled a bunch of things, um, really fixed up the place. So it sounds like it should be better than ever. Okay, great. Yeah, as you can see, it's a beautiful place. You can see the lake itself on the lower left. And uh, during during the uh, events that I'll talk about, Northern Night Starfest, we're allowed to use those canoes and do other activities there. Also, that Northern Night Starfest, which I haven't talked about yet, um, we actually don't bunk in the Markham House. We bunk in the North Star Lodge, which the facilities are a little bit nicer than the than the Markham House. So we'll see how that all evolves this year with changes based on COVID. So uh, what's up there and how do we get there? Um, on the left side of this, we have a picture of the 30-inch uh, Obsession, which is one of the largest upset oh, it is the largest obsession brand telescope made and also the 25 inch obsession and you can see those both can roll out from that garage which we uh call an observatory behind it um and on the right hand side of this it shows a map of of the facility itself so you can see you know i mentioned that the kids do this orienteering so the observatory is on a, a playing field or orienteering field uh where, where they uh, do that stuff there's also again the long lake and then to the north of this there's uh uh, a peat bog up there that that kids go through there's additional parking as well as uh on the left that blue blue spot that's designated as a parking lot there's that bigger parking lot up uh, north and you can see the facilities all of the buildings uh near the uh near the lake yeah i was, I was gonna say that the view through the 30 inch is truly amazing it brings out galaxies and nebulas really really well and you also probably don't want to be afraid of heights to go up on the ladder to watch, look through that thing. That is a true statement. Yeah, it's so dark up there that at one time, uh, people have, you've heard about gravitationally lensed galaxies. Normally those are really, really, really dim. In the 30 inch with good night, good skies, uh, some of our people have actually seen a gravitationally lensed galaxy uh, through the 30 inch. So getting to uh, Long Lake, it's just south of Palisade, which is a little town, but it's uh, basically northwest of McGregor, Minnesota. We do have the driving directions on the website and in the back of the Gemini newsletter. Uh, but basically, here's a map of the area. You can see it's a little bit north of Mille Lacs Lake, uh, go up six, 169 from there. Um, typically, most people go up either 65 or go up uh, Interstate 35 over to Finlayson and then cut across. But you can see a little bit northwest of McGregor, a little bit northeast of Aiken. And again, this is Aiken County with 15,000 people and one stoplight, so it's dark. So I mentioned a little bit briefly uh, the Northern Night Star Fest. So in, in addition to that, uh, the uh, Camping with the Stars uh, annual regional star party that we have down at Eagle Lake. We have Northern Night Star Fest, which is another regional star party that we have up at LLCC in August. Here's some pictures taken of, of that. We have inside the North North Star Lodge, um, which is depicted in the lower left and the lower right. We'll have the welcome uh, welcome area and hold raffles and stuff like that there, and also have lectures during the day for Northern Night Star Fest. And of course, the core of it is observing on the observing field, whether it's with uh, the 25 and 30 inch obsession or people's own, own telescope mostly. Now, as of when I put this slide set together, we didn't have the information on the 11th annual uh, one coming up. This is a screenshot from last year's, but you can see the sort of thing that we're doing there. Looking through the largest scopes that we have, the 25 and 30 inch, uh, some uh, observing challenge lists, presentations, the bunkhouse lodging. Uh, they do provide dinner, uh, basically a brunch dinner and midnight snacks for the observers. And we have daytime activities, you know, including the presentations, a swap meet and stuff like that, and a door prize. Uh, as of when I put the this together, so unless Mark has any new information, uh, 
the schedule and availability is to be determined. When I said this, it was because of that limbo situation, but since they are coming back, I'm assuming it will be scheduled pretty soon. So if yeah, people it's, watch. Uh, it's the, starts the Wednesday before Labor Day through including through Sunday night, I believe. Okay. Yeah. Typically what we do is the Wednesday through observing Saturday night and then, you know, sleep through Saturday morning and head home sometime on, on Sunday rather. Yeah. This year, because it's Labor Day, we get an extra day. Okay, cool. Um, okay. So anyway, LLCC again, um, Unlike Eagle Lake, which is open to the public, this is not open to the public. Basically, except for the NNSF, you have to be an MAS member uh, and your immediate family. We're authorized to attend to the scheduled events, star parties only. Not There's no impromptu star party or personal observing. It has to be during star parties because of all of their other activities happening. Uh, we have to sign up on the discussion forum for because of the COVID-19 again, because we have a limit of, unless it's changing uh, 10 people on the field at any one time. Uh, and again, Markham House or perhaps the North Star Lodge bunk rooms, depending on what we're going to do. And we do have the key holder training. And typically in past years, that's only been held during the Northern Night Star Fest because that's when we have all of the uh, LLCC committee members available to do the training. So you're seeing a running theme on COVID-19 updates. You have to pre-schedule yourself. You have to make a reservation on the web form uh, to figure out to, so we know how many people are signing up at any given location. Okay, from our darkest site to our earliest site. So the Metcalf Observing Field is in uh, outside of Afton. It's in rural Afton. And this is the MES's earliest site. It was formed, it was uh, first used in 1971 or 1972. It's a little site on uh, the Indian Trail Road in, Af in the area of Afton. And as you can see, it's basically a uh, just a, uh, a field here. So it's one of the least developed sites we have. As a matter of fact, that warming house that you can see there, that little shed, uh, that is disappeared because it was kind of getting rotten. So we're working on, uh, on working on what we end up doing. Looking to the south from that same, if a person turned around, obviously these two pictures were taken at different times of the year, but it was taken from about the same spot. The one behind was taken looking to the north. The one with the green grass is looking to the south. And the end of the Metcalf property is that fence. Unfortunately, we have a neighbor just to the south of us that planted a bunch of trees and they keep on growing. So it's a bit of a problem there. Um, so Mark had told me earlier this week that the, those because those trees to the south are continuing to grow and we don't have the opportunity to cut them down, the sight lines are getting a little bit worse. So it's kind of hard to even see the planets uh, depending on where you are in the field. So we're considering either uh, putting the new storage shed at Metcalf and housing a 12 inch uh, LX200 in there, or possibly picking another spot on the Bellwin property. And I haven't mentioned Bellwin other than in passing so far, we'll talk about that in more detail. But uh, there may be a little bit of uh, uh, change in the works for Metcalf Observing Field. Um, Right now, uh, the uh, COVID-19 rules for Metcalf Observing Field is, well, we uh, basically you have to sign up on the Metcalf Field Discussion Forum indicating you want to attend a Metcalf Impromptu Star Party, that's what ISP stands for. Um, and also uh, Shresh holds a beginner SIG observing meetings quite often at Metcalf and then we sign up for those as well. So again, common theme, because of COVID, we have to sign up and meet maximum occupancy limitations. Um, I mentioned Belwyn. Belwyn is the landlord or the owner of Metcalf Field. Um, a little history of Metcalf Field before I go too much farther. Again, it was the MES's first observing site starting in, you know, with the formation of the Twin City Astronomy Club, which was the MES's predecessor. Uh, it was 1971 or 72 that it started. Um, it's called Metcalf Field because around the corner from it, uh, is, was Father Metcalf's house and he owned the field. So that was the origination of the name. Um, when he passed away, his family deeded it to the Science Museum of Minnesota, which uh, also allowed us to continue observing on the site. Uh, they didn't do the things that the Metcalf family wanted them to do with it. So they basically took it back from the Science Museum and deeded it over to Belwyn Conservancy. 
So Bellwin Conservancy is the, uh, the current owner of the Metcalf field as well as the rest of Bellwin uh, land. They hold about 1400 acres of natural land in the St. Croix Valley. Their main thing is uh, environmental uh, conservation, hence the name. And what they're doing is taking a lot of that acreage and turning it back to the natural state that it was before this invasive species called humans came in and started, you know, introducing non-native plants and non-native houses and all of that stuff. So uh, basically a big natural land organization getting rid of uh, buckthorn and other non-native species. So our relationship with them started around 2008 and we wanted to build an observatory on Bellwin land with their, with their assistance and, and their approval. So we worked out an agreement. We created uh, what's now known as Joseph J. Casby Observatory. So we started construction of that observatory in October 2009 and it was finished and dedicated in August 2010. That observatory is a 16 foot motorized uh, ash brand. It's made of out of uh, steel uh, dome. And that houses a couple of very large uh, telescopes. I'll show the pictures of those in a little bit. Um, where's this at? So if you take a look with St. Paul to the left of this picture, uh, come out I-94 and take the uh, I or, uh, Highway 95, Minnesota Highway 95 or Manning Avenue South, it's the same thing, exit. Take the frontage road down and go east from there. Uh, you'll find the turn to go onto the Indian Trail South which is a, a small, uh, you know, it's a paved road, but it's a small road. And Metcalf Field is on that, on that site. If you were to continue onward on the Indian Trail to the end where it uh, terminates at Stagecoach Trail and then make a right turn, the front gates to Bellwin is on the left-hand side of that on the east. So it's basically 15 miles out from, you know, or not even 15 miles, 15 minutes out from, from St. Paul. Uh, once you get into the Bellwin property, uh, you can see the stagecoach trail on the left. There's a gravel uh, driveway, and then there's a gated entrance to a, a small gravel road that goes through the woods coming up to, uh, if you look, travel that line, you know, from left to right, and then comes back down, you'll see the Bellwin Center, which is a uh, St. Paul Public Schools uh, uh, classroom building. And then right behind that, we have the Joseph Casby Observatory. And you can see the, uh, just from this overall map, the Bullrush Slough and stuff like that, it's all uh, natural, excuse me, it's an all natural area. So it's a, just a beautiful place to uh, observe from. Taking a look at some of the pictures, you can see this overhead picture uh, of Bowen. The uh, Joseph Casby Observatory in the lower left of that one wooded picture, and you can just kind of see peeking through the woods on the right hand side of that same picture, that classroom building that we were talking about. And uh, one of the views of the of the observatory from uh, when we were constructing it in the wintertime, and then with the dome open. And this is one of the very few observatories in the world with with actual windows in it, because they're facing east and why not, because <laughs> we use it in the dark anyway. Uh, in addition to the observatory itself, it's equipped with four pads that you can take your own uh, telescope and uh, put it out on the pad and, and observe. Inside the dome itself, we have a 10-inch uh, TMB, so it's the big brother of that refractor that was in the Sylvia Casby Observatory building. So this is a 10-inch TMB refractor on an astrophysics mount. Uh, it's also equipped with... Um, Think, see, think. I forgot to write it down. Um, Merle, you can probably help me out if you're still there. What else is on there besides the eight inch TMB? Nope, we've got a, um, uh, a, so, a solar uh, scope, an 80 millimeter lens, and a five inch TOA. Ah, that's right, a five inch uh, Takahashi TOA. Okay, perfect, and thank you. So anyway, uh, that ties for, from what I'm told, that that 10 inch TMB, that's Thomas M. Beck refractor, uh, ties for the largest refracting telescope in the state of Minnesota. So a couple of other views for the Joseph Casby Observatory, um, just showing the wilderness area. Uh, those those uh, 
deer were taken, the picture of the deer were taken in nearby area. Uh, and you can see that we're up on top of the sand hill and uh, you can get a view of the observatory with uh, some of the observing pads there. So talking about access to it. So uh, because of Bellwin's primary uh, mission, which is you know, maintaining, uh, maintaining and increasing native grasses and the native prairie condition of the state of Minnesota, of the, that area in the state of Minnesota in the St. Croix Valley. Um, basically, we have to go through training to uh, make sure that we maintain and, uh, you know, uh, maintain respect for the environment. Um, for getting at the place, we can use this anytime. It's MES members only, allowed at any time. Uh, we have to be Bellwin and Joseph Casby Observatory trained. Uh, access to it, uh, on that map I showed this uh, 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 gravel road or gravel trailway that leads into the woods uh, that branched off from their main driveway. That's uh, got a, a chain combination lock and a gate that you swing open. and. Uh, we you know, sign in at that and then uh, open up the combination lock after we've been trained and we can have access to it anytime. We will be having training coming up next month. Uh, the first 2021 observatory training and Bellwin training uh, will be April 10th, starting at three o'clock. So uh, to do this, you must be a member in good standing of the MES, which is a common thing, uh, at least 18 years of age. So we're basically holding key holder status to adults only. Uh, and you have to complete the Bellwin uh, Conservancy orientation. That's the first half hour of the training. And then the next hour or so is training on the observatory itself. And to uh, do that, you sign up on the Joseph Casby Observatory Discussion Forum. Um, so basically, again, uh, going at the place, so the COVID-19 up COVID update for Bellwin Conservatory, uh, Bellwin Conservancy, if I say that right, uh, again, uh, it is for MES members and their uh, guests only. Uh, we have to be trained on it. We have to sign up for this, uh, for this uh, impromptu star party on the Joseph Casby discussion forum. And because of the size of the observatory, we're limiting it to five people concurrently. Um, all of these rules are located on, you know, for all of the sites are located on the website at the uh, follow the right below the uh, the main part of the website, uh, the homepage, you'll see this uh, discussion about COVID-9 and there's a click here uh, to get more information link and it's easy to navigate to those rules from there. So in addition to those four main observing sites, we do have people that like to observe at other places. So I have a couple of things that aren't really MES sanctioned or MES properties themselves, but a couple of other places that people do like using. So one of those is Carver Park Reserve in Carver County, east of Eagle Lake Observatory, so not quite as far out. And also one called Crex Meadows that's uh, north of Grantsburg, Wisconsin. So I'll talk about those just a little bit. Uh, the Carver Park Reserve, um, Shresh, Shreena Vassan, who's our beginner SIG coordinator, uh, is the one that kind of came across this first. Really nice place. I've only been there once myself, once or twice myself. Uh, very little local light pollution, and the skies are about, about as dark as Eagle Lake, even though it's quite a, quite a ways in. You can see it's on the other side of Waconia from Eagle Lake. Um, you do have to get onto the MES approved list with the county. Uh, you contact Shresh about it uh, through that links page the you know the uh, leadership about us page and where you can enter the web form and send an email to uh, Shuresh on that on that page to say hey can you get me on that list and get me information so I can uh, uh, go into uh, uh, Carver Park Reserve. Don't have any pictures of the place but it's a nice nice place uh, and really a good place for some informal observing if you don't want to get out all the way to one of our observing sites. Another one, totally opposite direction, is Crex Meadows, northwestern Wisconsin near Danbury. I've got the Google Map street code and the uh, GPS coordinates on the screen here. Uh, so it's obviously uh, you go up to Pine City, uh, 35 to Pine City, and then take a right and head over to St. Croix State Park. And it's right in the area of St. Croix State Park. It's not in the park itself, but it's close to it. Um, inside Crex Meadows, the actual observing spot that we go to is called Rigel Overlook. Now, 
no facilities here. It's just literally a gravel parking lot. There's no power, there's no facilities, there's no restroom, just a little sign saying this is Rigel Overlook, but it is nice dark skies, beautiful horizons because it's flat. I'll show a picture of what the place looks like in a little bit. Um, but, um, and we don't have any reservations or anything. It's, you know, just come. Uh, it's a nice, it's a public area. The one thing that's bad about it is it's also a public area and somebody may come by, not, it's not too often at night, but they may come by. Uh, if you're really worried about it, you can, only, you can make up a cardboard sign and say astronomer observing, turn your headlights off and cross your fingers that they'll do so, so you don't get night blinded. Uh, one thing I found when I went there during the day is there's a lot of mosquitoes there potentially, so bring lots of mosquito spray. Uh, looking at Crex Meadows itself, this is the wildlife area. Danbury, Wisconsin is just to the south off of the map on this. Um, the way I got to it was on the left-hand side of this map, I went up north on County Road F, or yeah, County Road F, I think it is from Wisconsin, turned right on that North Refuge Road, which is in the upper left-hand corner of it, and uh, headed east on that and made those curves around. And honestly, the one time I was there, I don't remember if it was exactly at this corner of where that little arrow is between eight, nine, and 10, or if I think it's actually at that corner of where that uh, North Refuge Road can turn south to uh, whatever that is on the right side of that, that hatched area. I think it's just to the left of 11. But anyway, it's it's marked and it's on the northern part of Crex Meadows and it's overlooking, you can see this uh, swamp and wild area. So very flat, very good horizons, very dark. Um, and it's really a, a good observing place. A lot of, you'll notice on the discussion forums, a lot of people go there and uh, have a good time. Okay, uh, that's it for for locations. Let's talk about the star parties a little bit more in a little bit more detail, even though I've kind of talked about a lot of stuff. Most of the star parties are scheduled for Friday night and Saturday night is the backup in case Friday is cloudy. So we used to have go no go calls done by the uh, observing coordinator, but we found out with in recent years, you know, everybody has the same access to sites like clear dark sky and uh, clear outside and the NOAA uh, weather satellites and stuff like that. And, you know, even things like, you know, CARE 11's uh, weather site. So everybody has the same access to the, uh, to the weather sites and the sky darkness sites. So it basically uh, we schedule the star parties and it's up to you to determine if you want to go or not. The exception to that is major events, which I've only talked about a few of them, uh, but we have, you know, specifically scheduled events like Messier Marathon, the fall uh, MES Mini Messier Marathon, Virgo Venture, uh, other events like, uh, you know, if there's a conjunction or if there's a, you know, whatever may be happening. Um, we, we have some scheduled events and for those we'll quite often uh, do a go no go call based on weather and put that information on our information line. The primary locations for MES member star parties are down at Cherry Grove, again the one that's uh, south of Cannon Falls, and Lake, Long Lake Conservation Center up north. Um, those are the ones that we schedule the dates for the star parties. Um, now we don't really schedule MES member star parties at at, uh, at Eagle Lake Observatory because of its outreach type of uh, status. You know, people will, you know, if as soon as we open up the uh, observatory, people that are camping or or doing their stuff at Eagle Lake will mm -hmm. kind of naturally gravitate to the to the observatory. So it's really hard to have MES member only star parties. So you can certainly do it. You, you certainly can use the facility, but you can't do it with an expectation that you're going to be alone and not get bothered. People are going to come up and, hey, can I look through your scope, which most of us don't mind anyway. Uh, but because of that, we don't have quote unquote MES member star parties at Eagle Lake. We have the public outreach star parties and then just people observing. Um, the Metcalf Observing Field and Joseph Casby Observatory, we don't schedule star parties there, but we use impromptu star parties, where basically, as we mentioned before, members will post their intent to go to the site uh, on the web form and then simply go there. So to find out when we have the scheduled star parties, it's all on uh, mnastro.org slash events uh, or on, I'll show the navigation in a little bit. Again, uh, star parties, 
for members are typically closest to the new moon or the third quarter because the third quarter moon comes up later in the evening, you know, after midnight. So those are the best ones with the dark skies. One thing I want to point out at the bottom of this slide is uh, star party attendance is not mandatory. Unlike the Eagle Lake Observatory public observing nights where we will have volunteers there if, if we have a scheduled uh, public observing uh, observer, bleh, start, starting to stutter here, uh, a public observing night, um, star parties, we don't say thou shalt have somebody there for this evening. The reason I bring that up is there was one time quite a few years ago that we had uh, a Metcalf star party scheduled and at the same time we had a pretty good event over at Eagle Lake Observatory and it turns out everybody went to Eagle Lake and nobody showed up at, at Metcalf Field. Well, we had somebody that was not a member yet, but wanted to learn some stuff, brought, um, you know, wanted to come out and talk with some people and learn about telescopes and stuff. And he went to Metcalf first, found it a little bit hard to find, and second, sat around for a couple of hours waiting for somebody to show up and never, nobody ever showed up. And so he wrote us a scathing email after that, uh, saying, you know, this is not right. So that's why I wanna point out that unlike the public observing nights, star party, you know, it's members going out and having their own phone and doing their own thing. So you may find yourself together with dozens of other people, or you might be the only one there. If it's a nice night out, chances are there's going to be a lot of other people there, but you know, don't count on it. If you want to do something that you need help with a new telescope or you want help observing or you just want to chat with other people come to something that's that's scheduled and uh, you know ba basically come to eagle lake because we know we'll have people there unless you've you know scheduled things you know with COVID, that's maybe one positive as i think of it uh because of scheduling on the forums because people are going to say hey i'm coming out to this impromptu star party so because of that temporarily you can probably count on people coming out to a to an impromptu star party but it's only because of the COVID reservations that we're currently under when things come back to normal you know keep keep that in mind i guess and the big the b sig events are pretty reliable too and they're Oh yeah, definitely the big SIG events. Well, uh, Shresh, you know, again, because of COVID, Shresh has to uh, take reservations for the BSIG events as well. So it's going to be the same kind of thing that they're going to, they're going to come and, uh, you know, we know we'll have people there. And besides that, for the BSIG beginner special interest group events that Shresh does, we usually get a really good turnout. Uh, those uh, in non-COVID times have been as many as 50 people. So anyway, all of these star parties, they're, you know, the guidelines are on the website at the location I have on here. And uh, anything beyond the public observing nights and scheduled events, like I talked about, the Camping with the Stars, Northern Night Star Fest, Astronomy Day in the spring and Astronomy Day in the fall, uh, and things like that, they're considered impromptu star, star parties. And we require the pre-registration because of COVID on the discussion forums. Um, in general, uh, for star party etiquette, you know, you want your eyes to be dark adapted. So try to arrive early enough, a little before sunset or at least around sunset. So there's enough light to get set up. Try to avoid after it's dark, uh, white lights. You know, we know things don't work, you know, cars light up like Christmas trees nowadays <laughs> for safety and everything else they do. So it's impossible to, to avoid it completely, but try to avoid it. And, you know, in light of the cars lighting up and doing, you know, as soon as you turn on the ignition, consider where you're parking in respect to others, and especially if you're planning on leaving early or something like that. So, you know, just common sense to try to keep from uh, light flashing other people. Um, best to leave pets and small animals at home because they can run around, they could, you know, damage equipment or just get in people's way. Kids definitely are welcome, but uh, personal experience, I've seen that small kids get bored after about 10 minutes. So, you know, that would limit your own observing session. And because aside from one thing I forgot to mention, the only place that we own the property is Cherry Grove. Every place else, we're a guest of the tenant of the organization that owns the land. We're a guest at Baylor Regional Park. We're a guest at Long Lake Conservation Center. We're a guest on Bellwin's property, both Metcalf and Joseph Casby. So please, no littering and please, you know, bring, you know, if there's trash cans there like there is in the park, you know, dispose of it or, you know, smaller sites, bring it back with you. And uh, just generally, you know, be a good person. That's all it takes. Um, 
kind of a review of this star parties and private observing e elo it's mes members and guests uh it's a outreach facility uh key holders can use eagle lake observatory at any time they want as long as they're trained and you know they are a key holder uh and we talked about that gate already Sherry Grove, uh, no, no restrictions aside from the COVID restrictions for Star Party. Uh, MES members, guests, people drop in. We'll have people from the area drop in sometime. We, there aren't any restrictions to that because uh, we own the property. Metcalf Observing Field. The interesting thing about that because uh, Metcalf has existed as an observing site since about 71. Anybody comes, whether they're a member, former member, they're interested in astronomy, but they've never been a member. Anybody can come, uh, no time restrictions. Uh, the only thing is for code, the, you know, take into account the COVID stuff. Uh, Joseph Casby, again, uh, MES members and guests only. Uh, they do have uh, some Bellwin events, a couple of them a year, where all they will host things at the observatory. So we'll have to, you know, share it with them at those times. But basically, uh, MES members and guests. So we don't have it open to the public aside from the Bellwin events. And we have to go through the training and, and uh, be aware of the Bellwin policy. Uh, otherwise, there's no restriction for the key holders. Uh, not open to the public, but it's open to MES members that are trained anytime they want to use it. On the other end of that spectrum, the LLCC up north, uh, that one is scheduled star parties only uh, for MES members only. Uh, and we can only do it at that time, as I mentioned before. All right, that's it for the uh, observing sites and parties and all that stuff. What, what else does the MES have to offer? So some communications, we have uh, quite a few different things that we can do. So, you know, that's one cool thing about the hobby of astronomy. Most of it's observing or, and or imaging, but there's a lot of other things you can do too. You know, talk about cosmology and stuff, uh, you know, armchair astronomy, research, a lot of other things that can happen. So we've got a lot of other things we can look at. So we do have the monthly meetings and I'll talk about all of these things in detail in upcoming slides here. We have the website for communications and the discussion forum for topical communication. We also have an email distribution list set of them, uh, which kind of predated the discussion forum. So they're not used quite as much. Then we also have one telephone in the entire club. Uh, society, excuse me. Um, we do have a message service phone number, which is basically a recording, and you can leave a message at the end of it. Uh, it's not used for that purpose very often. It's supposed to be picked up, but uh, it's one of those things where it rings one way for the message service and it rings another way for the own an observatory phone. So the phone, the one phone that we own is inside of own an observatory and it has a different ringtone. So if you're in Onan and you hear the phone ring and nobody goes to pick it up, we're not being rude. We know which ring it was and it's somebody just going for the message service. And they're expecting to listen to an announcement there and going, why did you pick up? I don't want to talk to you. <laughs> um, I, 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 I want to interrupt a little on the phone thing. We are in a state of transition on that. We're probably going to go down to one phone number and uh, we'll, we'll update things as time goes on. Good point, yep. Yeah, this is really historical information. We've had that message service and observatory phone for 20 years now. Um, so in addition to those other types of communication, we also have the Gemini newsletter and it's a bi-monthly uh, electronic publication. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail. So the monthly meetings uh, pre-COVID and hopefully after COVID uh, is held the first Thursday of the month um, from seven o'clock to nine o'clock. We and people come earlier than seven o'clock for you know six thirty or so for you know just informal chatting, and we get kicked out a little bit after nine o'clock. You know, kind of a social hour. And uh, what we've been doing in the past year, to couple of years, was uh, kind of having an after meeting meeting over at the. Uh, uh, old Chicago uh, over in Harmar Mall, but that's not, you know, uh, uh, that's not an official part of it. But anyway, it's held at the Fairview Community Center and I hope we, we will return there. Not anymore. To oh no, what happened now, Mark? The building's gone. What? Yeah. Okay, ignore all of this stuff then. <laughs> I didn't so know that. We are, we are looking for a new place. Um, we might wind up back there again uh, after the whole COVID thing is up over um but they weren't so sure okay one thing i didn't think to check when i was updating this presentation was going over there and seeing if the building was still there good grief. yeah it's probably meeting the wrecking ball i think it started either last month or this month 
<laughs> okay. We had to well, go clean our locker out. I guess we better, yeah. We did. We did. We did. Okay, we did. good. Um, the reason we did that there, if anybody, if it matters now, was that uh, you know we hold smaller meetings, like like uh, uh, special interest group meetings, at at various public library meeting rooms throughout the Twin City area. Unfortunately, you can't schedule those multiple times in advance. You can only get those like a month in advance. So the Fairview Community Center was a really good place that we could schedule repeatedly and have the same location every month. So that's unfortunate to hear that it's uh, in limbo right now or going away and may or may not come back. Oh, well, in the meantime, we, uh, for the last year, we've been doing uh, zoom meetings uh we've been trying a number of uh online meeting type things you know google meet and stuff like that we've settled on zoom meetings we are still doing these monthly meetings the first thursday of every month uh from seven o'clock to whenever it finishes it could be as late as nine o'clock generally it's been finishing up at 8 30 or so uh, the zoom meetings will be published the url will be published on the home page within a couple of days before it so just click to the you know go to the home page and click on the link and attend the meeting using your pc a tablet smartphone or you know a phone line if that's all you can use. We do ask that you try to mute your line and disable video to keep the bandwidth down and, and keep disruption down. Mark is just like this meeting is being uh, recorded. We do record them and make them available for later playback on YouTube. So if you can't uh, attend a monthly meeting, not a bad thing. You can uh, go to the replay later on. So in addition to that, uh, some other things we have. So um, when a person um, becomes a member of the MES or renews their membership in an MES, they get a new membership ID card. Now we don't use the ID cards for anything official, but they're a nice little reference piece of uh, information. You can see a couple of uh, example ones here. If you notice the one on the left has a key on it, and this is indicating keyholder status. So this person had been trained at Joseph J. Casby Observatory, and it could say, you know, CGO, JJCO, ELO, and so on, uh, depending on what what their uh, what their key holder at, or it just says your member benefits on the side. Uh, one thing that it's nice for is uh, that it does show your membership type. And if you have any question, oh gosh, when did I last renew it? Am I do I, am I due to renew it in July or September or October or November? So it has your expiration date on here. I will notify you as the membership coordinator a couple of months before your expiration and uh and send you a paper one if you haven't renewed the month the month leading up to your expiration but in case you want to know at any time that information is there on the back of the card we've got a nice reference for a, uh hey i'm at an observing site and i ran into a problem i've redacted all of the personal information on here uh but you know for the alarm codes for joseph casby and cherry grove uh phone numbers for uh own an observatory uh, the gate codes for ELO, uh, how to get a hold of Merle or the park if there's problems at ELO, how to get hold of John if we have problems at Joseph Casby or Bellwin if we have problems at Joseph Casby. Uh, if we have problems at Cherry Grove, either call Vic or myself. Um, and at LLCC, you know, how to get a hold of Ken uh, or the LLCC staff. So that information is on your, your card uh, when you uh, obtain or renew your membership. We also have, when we finally start uh, in-person meetings again, we have plastic name badges that we can use for identification at the meetings. Uh, you basically just fill out a form and it goes to one of the board members that's taking care of the uh, the badges and they'll create, uh, create the uh, name badge and give it to you at the next meeting. Also at ELO for the volunteers, we have similar name badges that you can wear so the public can identify you that you're someone that can help them out rather than another member of the public. Um, I've talked about the website a lot. It's a pretty extensive website. So you can see the navigation across the top and look down at the categories. So events, if you look down at the bottom, that's where you can see the calendar. Uh, and you can see all of the individual events and a description of them. Astronomy Day in the spring and fall, Camping with the Stars, uh, any special events that are loaded up in there, the Messier Marathon and so on. Uh, under Explore, the one that I click the most is Discussion Forum. That's the way I get to the Discussion Forum. But there's a lot of other information there. For example, the Gemini Newsletter can be uh, reached through that, that link. 
uh, members. So members, if you go to member benefits, that's the place you can go to uh, find out more information similar to what I'm presenting today. Also, if you need to find out how do I um, how do I uh, subscribe to astronomy or sky and telescope magazine that's under the member benefits, uh, how to become a key holder, actually uh, a lot of information there. The facilities link, of course, that's detailed information about each of the facilities. The about us uh, link gives us the leadership. So when I first started out this presentation and had that about us leadership, how to how to uh, contact the leadership, the link is there. And then, of course, we're affiliated with a lot of other organizations, some of which I've spoken to and some that I'll talk about in a little bit here. In addition to the MAS web page it's, or website itself, we have the discussion forums, which was linked there. Um, generally, the way that I use it, well, first before I talk about that, it there are both public and member only areas. So if you're not signed up as a member, you'll be restricted to what you can see on it. So I do urge everybody to sign up as a member of the forum. You have to do that yourself because you get your own password and everything. So we don't want to give you a password. Uh, you want to keep that private. Uh, that's why we ask you to register for the forums and the information on it is, you know, there's site information, there's committee information, there's special interest group information, um, outreach, outreach requests, a lot of good stuff on there. My normal navigation is simply I look down the left side and I see those red highlights and that says, oh, I haven't looked at that yet. Those are the unread messages. You can also go up to the quick links in the in the top and take a look and see your posts, uh, new posts, unread posts, so you can search that way. Also, if you really want to make sure that you're not going to miss any postings, at the bottom of each forum topic, um, you can see the forum permissions, but also uh, down at the bottom, you can see now that MES home board index, board index does not mean the MES board index, that means the discussion forum board index. Uh, but you'll see to the right of that subscribe forum. So you can subscribe to the forum and it will, the bulletin board will email you uh, when there's a change on that. Now what's weird about this is that check mark indicates that I'm not subscribed yet. That's indicating check I want to subscribe to it. So you click on subscribe forum, it'll pop up and, and you can subscribe to the forum or you can if it doesn't have a check box in that or a check in that box and you click on it uh, and you can unsubscribe from the forum. So it's kind of backwards on the way that that works, but it's the way it is. Uh, in regards to identities on forums, what we do prefer is, you know, the internet is a big, wide, wonderful, wild place, and most people want to remain anonymous on the internet. However, because we're using these discussion forums for discussion between a fairly concise group of people, it's all people that want to work together in the enjoyment of the hobby of astronomy, it'd be nice if you uh, use your real name or at least something related to your real name, uh, and you know maybe even have your picture or something you know a picture that looks like you somewhat at least uh, for your avatar. You know a lot of people do have just a funny avatar, uh, but you know it's nice to have a uh, a sense of community so that we know who each other you know how we can we can communicate between ourselves. Um, Predating the discussion forums, we, you know, this used to be our primary means of uh, real time communication, near real time communication was the emails. We still use them. They're not used quite as much as before, but they're still there. So you can contact the board members again. You can uh, use a, lo a lot of this stuff. Um, you know, you can use that context information, but also uh, there's an outreach team, own an observatory information, email list, Cherry Grove committee. Uh, email list. Uh, and there is a general MES member mailing list. So instead of kind of a pull mechanism of the forums where you have to go to the forum and look for messages, people can post to MES at mnastra.org and it will push or reflect that email out to all of the other people that have subscribed to that. So uh, if you want to subscribe to any of these email lists, um, go to the uh, list mnastra.org list information. You can navigate by going to the home page, to the members, member benefits, and then email list. And it'll go to the right page where you can sign up for uh, email distribution lists. We've talked about that message service. It may change. Um, so that 
two tel well, two phone numbers, but one telephone currently, which may be reducing to one. So we may be getting rid of this message service. Uh, but for a long time, we used to have the Star Party Go No Go messages. We still do them for scheduled events, not for plain old star parties, but mostly it's just an MES announcement. Um, that's a long announcement. It can be as long as about a minute and a half. If you listen through the entire thing, it's a voicemail system. You can listen through the announcement and then uh, leave a message. And our secretary is supposed to be checking it once a week or so. So you may get a response within a few days or a week or two. Uh, again, currently the message service phone number is different than the own and observatory phone number. And this is the number. So so uh, I'm sure we'll post more information when we make any changes on that. So beyond the, the uh, meetings and all of the web type stuff, we have publications. So the MAS since, so oh gosh, a long time ago, I don't remember the date, we've been publishing a bi-monthly newsletter. Uh, it used to be quite some time ago, a paper publication, but because of uh, just rising costs of publication and everybody who's on, online nowadays, uh, we're doing an electronic publication only. But it is issued in February, April, June, August, October, and December. Um, it's downloadable, printable, printable PDF format. Nice part about it being in PDF format is you can get color pictures now in it instead of the black and white publication that it used to be. Um, and it, the current issues and all archive inch issues dating all the way back to the beginning, all of them that we could find about are at uh, About Us newsletter, and there is a navigation from that member benefits. Um, so the MES has the Gemini newsletter as our publication. As an MES member, you're also automatically a member of the Astronomical League. The Astro League sends out a, the Reflector magazine uh, quarterly. So you'll get a copy of that. Also, the AL has a North Central region, and you can sign up for their Northern Nights newsletter, which is another electronic PDF distribution. This one you do have to sign up uh, for uh, you know yourself. I have the information for anybody that's a new member, and I've sent you the uh, new member welcome letter. It's got, got about three pages of information plus the, the brochure. I have the URL for signing up for that uh, in that welcome letter. And anybody else that listens to us, just shoot me a note and I can give you that information if, if you don't have it. Uh, other publications, it's not really a publication of the MES, but as a member of, a, of an astronomy club, you get your allowed a discount to Astronomy Magazine and Sky and Telescope Magazine. So those discounts are available to active members of clubs. Sky and Telescope, uh, because their ownership changed, they recently increased their price a little bit. Uh, it's currently $43.95 annual, but for that $43.95, you get a print and the digital subscription, so you can look at it online. Or if you want the digital only, you can do it for a lower cost as compared to the $54.95 sub standard subscription price. Um, you do it at one year at a time with Sky and Telescope. Astronomy Magazine, uh, they can give you one year, two year, or three year uh, uh, subscriptions and against the standard subscription rate of $58.95. So a pretty substantial discount for members uh, with both of those. How to do it, the information is on the website uh, under member benefits, but uh, basically you go to their website and whoops, and do club renew and subscribe online, or you can call their customer service number and, and do it if you want to do it via uh, not going online. If you want to have them send you a form and you can do it with a check if you don't like to uh, put your information out over the internet. Uh, similar thing with Astronomy Magazine, you can go to astronomy.com slash club member and do it online, or you can call their customer service number, say that you're a member of the MES, they may or may not ask for the MES ID number, which is this big long number, and you can pay either pay direct using a credit card or again ask for a form pre-printed, pre they'll send it to you and you can mail it in with a check. So either way, they're uh, good discounts. We used to uh, kind of proctor or whatever. We used to do an, be an intermediary and you'd the member would pay the MES and then we would collect them together and compile them uh, together a list of members going for the magazine and then sending them to the to the publisher. Um, two things, one, both, both publishers finally started giving us the ability to do it individually directly ourselves. And number two, we had a lot of problems with that old procedure. You know, there was a lot of time delay in a member mailing it 
from themselves to the MES post office box and we pick it up and we compile everything together and then mail it to the publisher. And it could take a long time and it could get lost in the mail, which kind of happened a lot with astronomy. So it really works out much better doing it this way. And it actually costs a little bit less. So anyway, beyond the publishing things, um, one of the benefits of the MES is that we have the special interest groups. And what's cool about the hobby of astronomy is there's a lot of sub hobbies within it. You know, there's amateur telescope making, you know, if you want to make or modify your telescopes or equipment or stuff like that, there's imaging. Um, there's, of course, observing, which is the core of it. Uh, you can also do real research, real scientific valid research. Um, uh, also, you know, going off other places and looking at stuff and building observatories. There's a lot of things we can do and we have uh, special interest groups for most of those things. And if you find that there's something that you want to do, like radio astronomy, maybe, and we don't have one of those going right now, but if you had a real interest in that, we could, you could start up a, uh, and lead a, 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 a special interest group like that. So the most active one is the beginner special interest group. Um, you know, getting started is the hardest thing because you walk into this, at least what I found when I joined 20 years ago, it's like, oh my gosh, all these people know so much more about this and I, I'm going to feel so stupid. I don't want to talk. Well, there may be a lot of people that have that same kind of attitude. Um, so if you're interested, you don't know where to start, you're intimidated by this stuff, get together with people that are your peers that are just starting out so you don't you know, feel intimidated by, uh, by not knowing the right terminology or you're having a telescope that's giving you fits because of whatever you can't get it collimated, you can get help. Um, so anyway, that's what the beginner SIG is all about, getting help for people starting out or even people that aren't just starting out but want to refresh or want to try delve into something new. Um, we do these monthly, monthly for the most part. Uh, occasionally, we have to miss one for some reason or another. Um, now, when we in the winter times, pre-COVID, we were doing them uh, at libraries, the library meeting rooms throughout the Twin Cities, and we'd kind of do some in the St. Paul side and some in the Minneapolis side, and kind of make it equally painful for travel for everybody, no matter where they're from. Um, during COVID now, of course, we're doing them online. So the next meeting is going to be next weekend, uh, Saturday, March 27th at one o'clock. Um, that is going to be the next meeting. And then uh, I think there's one more online meeting and then we go to uh, uh, doing uh, BSIG star parties. And those typically are held at Metcalf. So um, anything else to talk about that? Again, Shresh Srinivasan is the uh, the guy that runs the beginner special interest group, you can either email them at this address or contact them through that contact page on, on the website. Um, but we, because, again, because of COVID with beginner SIG, just like any other star parties, we have to sign up because of a maximum uh, attendance restriction. Um, special interest groups in general. So the observing SIG is primarily a forum based SIG because, you know, we observe when we're out star stargazing uh, and it's basically organized by events and the uh, Astro League coordinator and the observing coordinator uh, hands out uh, observing awards. Um, a couple of the people pictured here, the, the guy on the right with, or the, excuse me, the guy in the upper left picture is Greg Hobrick. He's a former uh, observing coordinator. It's now Jerry Jones, but uh, you can see with the Messier. So uh, Greg is one of our master observers. The guy on the right with three uh, three certificates that he won at one meeting is uh, uh, Dave Tostison. He's like our super master observer that he he's published in a number of magazines and stuff. So uh, do a lot of stuff. So anyway, there's a lot of observing SIG events in addition to uh, in, in addition to just regular star parties. Um, part of the observing SIG is really getting to know the astronomical league program. So the AL, it maintains over 70 individual observing programs. They used to call them observing clubs, but what their objective is, is to get us out under the stars and do something more than just look at the top five or six stuff. Uh, top top five or six items. So, you know, there's programs for beginners, intermediate, advanced, master observers. There's programs for dark sky sites. There's also uh, programs that you can do right in the middle of, right in the middle of uh, 
Minneapolis and St. Paul. So in the suburb, suburban and urban light pollution. That's all at astroleague.org observe. And this is not a complete listing of them, but it's a, a listing of a, quite a few of them. So the ones that I have highlighted in red are typical ones that we do with the binocular Messier program and the regular Messier program. That's kind of like the starting one. Messier objects, I won't get into the detail, but 110 of the most commonly observed items out there, some of the brightest stuff out there. But there's other ones like if you're really into dark skies, the dark nebula program, or if you're in the uh, suburban, suburban light pollution, the double star program works. Uh, global cluster, gl globular cluster program, stuttering again, that's actually moderated by one of our members, uh, Bob Kerr. Uh, and then again, if you're in suburban light pollution and want to do it in your, in our, uh, your backyard, the lunar program, lunar two, and I think there's a lunar three now as well. One that's really a cool program is the outreach award program. So uh, we have the Eagle Lake Observatory for uh, public outreach, and we have the, the volunteers there. You can get that award by doing nothing more than being a volunteer at uh, Eagle Lake Observatory or any of our other outreach activities for, you know, uh, for a certain number of hours. So a lot of things that, that are really of interest for uh, both observing and for outreach within the AL programs. Another one of our really active special interest groups is the imaging special interest group. Uh, because it's so equipment based, uh, both hardware and software, it's primarily a web based discussion forum. Um, we have had meetings, uh, in person meetings. We've also had quite a few uh, individual uh, uh, online meetings for it. Steve Baranski, Vault Streberg, who are who is our vice president, Mark Job on the line here, who's our president, and Doug Neverman and a few others have periodically hosted either getting started meetings and training or uh, individual specific, um, you know, specific software training, things like that. So uh, Mark, anything you want to add about that one, since you are one of the guys that's really active on the imaging special interest group? Yeah, I mean, we actually we have a event planned for later this summer um the first weekend in august um where we're actually having a workshop slash i don't know hands-on training however you want to look at that mostly workshop um we actually it's going to be landscape uh nighttime photography this year we actually have, have uh signed up uh mike shaw who is a member um to do to help us out with that so that'll be fun um it's kind of a we're working on specific modules for that um and you know you you alluded to the fact that there's hardware and software you know we'll if if, if we're seeing some some activity maybe we'll get together and and uh have a little talk about uh software um the big one is uh, the big software is is pix insights so a lot of astrophotographers use that to process their images so we'll spend time te teaching helping learning from each other whatever it takes and we've actually been doing quite a quite a bit of that um uh uh over over the last year with uh with covid and and before that we were meeting face to face but we're finding out that i think it works a lot better to actually get together online and and do it because you can share screens and talk and watch somebody else process, etc. So that's kind of fun. We, you know, that's kind of impromptu kind of just happens whenever somebody says, Hey, I got a topic I want to talk about, or, Hey, I'm having problems with something. So, you know, cool. you just got to watch the forums and uh, that's, that's how it happens. Yep. Everything's scheduled on the forums and announced on the forums. Okay. Thanks Mark. Appreciate it. I like that one on landscape. I'm as a non, imager myself, I might actually try that one. <laughs> and onward. Um, so moving from uh, imaging to outreach. Um, so we do a lot of outreach activities. Most of our stuff is centered around Eagle Lake Observatory, but there are a lot of other opportunities as well. Uh, Lila Blinkman is our outreach coordinator and she maintains basically when some when the outreach requests come in, she'll uh, publish them out on the outreach discussion forum. So people that are interested in doing it can uh, can volunteer for them. We'll get um, requests from things like scout troops, schools, uh, you know, school classes, other requests, some personal ones, um, 
typically they come in via the outreach request and you know get posted in addition to all of those ad hoc ones the bell, bell planetarium uh, and bell museum they host monthly star parties there and they can always use additional volunteers because we've got a number of scopes that are up on the plaza up there and we can always use more people that are outreach volunteers so the cool thing about it is you don't have to know that much um even i can do this one uh that uh, it's really fun to you know to have a view of saturn and somebody goes for the first time and they see saturn and it's like oh my gosh it's real or see jupiter or see the orion nebula or uh m13 the great globular cluster in hercules and stuff like that you know you only need to know a little bit more than the audience to to sound like a real expert so it's a real fun and uh you know kind of a big booster for both the people that you're talking to and for yourself um how do we find out about all of this stuff the, Allen, the annual calendar of events is posted on the website. So the month by month listing, it's uh, basically in this tabular format as well as available in a uh, calendar format, depending on which link you go to. Uh, but it's all at mnastro.org slash events slash calendar. Uh, also, if you want, you can see in the back of the Gemini newsletter, uh, we publish everything for the rest of the year. So since it's the beginning of the year, basically, uh, this shows, I had to cut it off on the bottom, but we show all of the star parties, you know, starting from March 12th through October 8th, where I, where I cut it off. There are more after that. Um, but and uh, also a little bit of information that helps you make a decision when it's completely dark and the moon, illumin moon illuminated percentage. So. Uh, number of ways to find the calendar of events, but uh, mostly go online and look for it. Um, in addition to the schedules, of course, on the website, one thing that's been really popular in 2020 because of COVID and people having more time being stuck at home is uh, obtaining the loaner scopes. We've got a really active loaner scope program. Uh, Anton Gregory runs the loaner scope program, uh, kind of reporting to the vice president because the VP is supposed to be responsible for it. But we've got a wide range of uh, non-computerized and computerized scope. So eight and 10 inch dobs, actually six, eight and 10 inch dobs, a couple of uh, Celestron CH cast screens, uh, one computerized, one more that's uh, not computerized, actually a couple of uh, CH computerized ones and so on. So basically for the loaner program, you have to be a member in good standing of the MES, even if it's a member in good standing for two minutes after you've uh, after you've signed up, um, and then you can go online and request a loaner. Um, you're guaranteed once you finally get one. You're guaranteed uh, 30 days, you know, a month on the scope. And if it's one of the less popular ones, and there's nobody in line behind you for on the schedule for that, you could probably get it for a second turn, you know, for keep it for 60 days or something like that. That's not guaranteed, but you are guaranteed at least a month uh, with the scope that you get. You can post to get, you know, what's your first preference, second and third preference, uh, and sign up to, to get a scope and, and use it on your own. Um, not much else to talk about that, uh, no, but a good wide range of scopes from, from uh, beginner to at least intermediate and that like that mead light switch on the right side is a re relatively advanced scope. So a good way to get a chance to play with them and use them and just figure out if you don't have your own scope yet, what kind do you really want? Because there are a lot of pros and cons and, and different characteristics of different types of scopes to determine, uh, you know, what's the best one for you. Um, I've talked about some of these things before, but just to cover it a little bit more, again, member discounts. You can get discounts to various things being a member of the MAS, both Sky and Telescope Magazine and Astronomy Magazine. I talked about the discount rates a little bit earlier. Also, Scub Sky Publishing, which is the Sky and Telescope company, uh, they give a 10% discount on S&T books to Astronomy Club members. The Astronomical League uh, book service gives you a 10% discount. And occasionally, we haven't been doing it too often in the last year or so, but occasionally we'll, you know, somebody will want to get something and they'll do group purchases, uh, whether it's an observer handbook or some amateur telescope making supplies or uh, software planetarium, observing planning software, things like that. So for all of those ad hoc things, just kind of keep a watch on the email list and more primarily on the web form to see when somebody announces that they want to do something like that.
Uh, some other discount opportunities, uh, Brandon Hamill, who is our kind of a roaming, and, roaming ambassador uh, member, he's worked out a, an agreement with a couple of things, uh, San Pedro Observatory out west, um, either uh, observatory hosting for $400 per month. Um, yeah, so it's a discount of 100 bucks a month uh, for actually going out there or 99 uh, per night telescope rental. Uh, so a couple of different things. So you can, what, $21, it's normally 120 per night. You can get 99 bucks a night. So um, basically a 20-ish percent discount for, uh, for remote observing or for if you go down there, uh, full-time observing. Uh, some other things, we have the MES merchandise. This one is not as well known anymore. It used to be a pretty big thing, but you can go from the MES homepage to explore MES merchandise where you can get t-shirts or hats or uh, messenger bags or cups and things like that with uh, MES logoed items and some uh, Onan specific items and some Cherry Grove specific items. So uh, we get a small amount of money from uh, from those, not a huge amount, but it's a, it's, you know, helps every little bit helps to fund things for the MES. Um, Want to talk about where to get things. So it used to be that we had one telescope store in town, Radio City, which was uh, amateur astronomy and more primarily ham radio. Unfortunately, Dan Fish retired a year before last, but he did move his astronomy products to Pioneer Cycle, which is maintained by one of his relatives. So if you want to take a look at new scopes, uh, take a look and see if Pioneer Cycle has what you want to get. Otherwise, you know, most of us are getting everything from the online retailers, whether it's Orion Telescope, uh, Oceanside Pacific, OPT Corp. Oceanside Pacific Telescope, I think is what that stands for, Astronomics or Star Arizona, all of those. Um, we have um, a lot of links in the Beginner SIG discussion forum. I have web links for beginners and all MES members. And among those links are information for a lot of stuff, including links to the retailers. So um, I've talked about this a little bit earlier, volunteer opportunities, but there's a lot of things you can do to get active in the MES. If you're so inclined, you can do the outreach things or Bell Museum things, uh, just you know helping out with our sites because the sites do take a fair amount to help uh, maintain. Um, you could become a, a observing site committee member. Uh, you could even lead or co-lead or assist with a special interest group. And we always need uh, Gemini articles. Father Brown is always looking for Gemini articles because uh, to this point, we have never resorted to putting articles in, republishing articles that were found elsewhere. They're all articles from our members. So really want to keep that going all the time. Um, additionally, at the monthly meetings, we, you know, we, we have a primary speaker that does a presentation. Quite often those are, uh, you know, research astronomers uh, and physics professors from the U of M or from other universities. Sometimes it's members talking about a trip they've done or a, uh, uh, you know, their experience, you know, building their own personal observatory, lots of things like that. But also what we like to do is have a program called Better Know a Constellation at the monthly meeting. Basically, it's a really cool way to just get to understand what's in a constellation pick a constellation and do a short, you know, five minute, 10 minute maybe presentation on, you know, uh, what's the mythology of a, of a constellation and, you know, what are some of the deep sky objects that are present in a constellation, stuff like that. I've done a number of those things myself and it's a good way to really learn some stuff about, uh, you know, just dig into a specific constellation and learn something about it and present it to others. Um, other volunteer opportunities that you can do kind of ad hoc or sidewalk astronomy, grab your scope and set it up somewhere during a, a transit or, you know, just during a nice summer night, uh, somewhere where people are walking by, drag them over to take a look at Jupiter or Saturn or the moon or things like that. And of course, you can volunteer for the EL, ELO key holder and participate in public nights and help run those scopes for the public. Um, so lots of things you can do to uh, uh, help out and volunteer with the cl with the the club. Um, outreach op opportunities. I've kind of talked about a few of them, but the scheduled and requested ones from schools and civic groups and things like that. The sidewalk astronomy, Bell Planetarium out on the Plaza, uh, Eagle Lake. 
Um, one thing I mentioned, I'm not sure if it's still continuing, but uh, up at Long Lake Conservation Center, um, it costs us to do the, uh, to, to maintain our presence up there. And to offset that, our memorandum of understanding with them said that if we uh, did a uh, presentation or a stargazing event for the public up at LLCC, for every one of those, we get a certain percentage off of our annual rental up there. So helping out with that. So a lot of things you can do to, uh, to participate in outreach, to be an active member of the club and just have a lot of fun doing it. So uh, coming up, starting to wrap up here, but some of the organizations we're affiliated with, I've mentioned already, but some, uh, you know, I may not have mentioned the Science Museum of Minnesota. We used to hold our, our meetings there until, uh, you know, the Excel Center across the street kind of created problems with parking and everything, which is when we switched to the uh, other locations. Uh, you know, we work together with the Bell Museum of History, Natural History and Bell Planetarium, the AL, of course, again, every member of the MES is a member of the Astronomical League by definition. Uh, we work a little bit with the IDA, International Dark Sky Association, to uh, help maintain dark skies. Uh, the Space Frontier Society, LLCC, of course, is our uh, landlord, if you will, at, the, at that observing site, and the Bellwin Conservatory is our uh, landlord at both Metcalf and Joseph Casby. Um, in wrapping up here, just a little bit of the history of the MES. We've been around for a long time. You can see it was founded as the Twin City Astronomy Club back in 1972. So it's been around for a long time, uh, but we were renamed as the MES and established as a 501c3 organization and created the constitution in 1980. Um, interesting thing for history, you can find this on the, uh, somewhere on the website, but that Larson telescope purchased from the University of Minnesota Duluth in July 1980. I didn't mention it when I was showing the Eagle Lake Observatory slides, but where the LX200 is now, there used to be a big classical Cassegrain scope, 16-inch uh, Cassegrain scope, called the that we had named the Larson telescope. It was a massive telescope. It, it had been called the largest telescope in Minnesota, which was incorrect, but it was the heaviest. It was a huge telescope that um, we bought from the UMD because they had shut down their, their uh, observatory and it kind of bounced around for a long time, but it became the reason that we created own an observatory, uh, which we opened up around uh, 2000. So, uh, a lot of history there. That particular telescope, the Larson telescope, had gone to Starring Lake in Eden Prairie, and then that actually had been replaced last year by another LX200. And I'm not sure where the Larson telescope is, but it's being relocated to another location somewhere, I think, on the north side of the Twin Cities. So a lot of history there. In addition to that, um, the one and only site that we own, uh, Cherry Grove, that was purchased in 1989. Um, you can see the uh, own an observatory was officially dedicated Astronomy Day in spring 2001. Uh, a couple of years after that, we wanted to get a large telescope. So our very first large truss job was that 24 inch bad that's currently down at Cherry Grove. Um, starting with 2005 2000, through 2009, we have an anonymous benefactor that's been tremendously generous with equipment, which gives us the basis for everything we can do. And he started doing that uh, primarily at uh, Onan Observatory in Eagle Lake, uh, you know, in the early part of this century. Um, we started that LLCC relationship in 2006. Uh, Bellman relationship started in 2007, and we built the observatory a couple of years after that. Um, started, you know, just updating things, built the Sylvia Casby Observatory in fall 2012. And one thing I didn't talk about earlier was a uh, number of our, our leaders got together and we decided to host the Astronomical League Convention, the ALCON, in July 2018, which is, was a great success. So really been an active organization through the years and continues to be so. So question, what do my dues pay for? So we've always tried to keep the dues as low as possible and we've done a pretty good job of that. Uh, the dues are $26 regular, $65 patron, or a $13 student. Now I mentioned that's before the PayPal fees offset because if you take a look at the join and you want to join via PayPal uh, online, the prices are actually there a little bit higher. So a regular is $27.50 and a patron is $67.25. The reason for the difference is with 
that difference in payment, that's a quote unquote voluntary contribution to offset the PayPal fee. And uh, if you don't wanna pay that voluntary fee, you basically pay your dues with a check and it's at these rates above me, uh, above that on the screen. Uh, so where do the membership dues go? They're kind of divvied up to a, quite a few things right off the top, uh, $5 per person for the Astronomical League membership, a little bit goes to the IDA. And there's a lot of just maintenance type items and um, insurance and things like that. Um, and by the way, the patron membership, so that $65 is 39 more than the standard $26 regular. And that is basically considered a contribution to the MES. Um, additional sources of income, basically donations, uh, that little bit we get from the Cafe Press, the MES merchandise. Um, Amazon affiliate program doesn't give a whole lot. Interest income on checking account. We used to get interest on, in, on checking. That doesn't really happen much anymore but it's a little bit, probably a couple of cents. And then of course, any donations that we get from the public get ELO, uh, astronomy and other events. Yeah, if I, if I could jump in about the smile.amazon, uh, we actually, already this year, we've gotten about $45 from that. So um, if you do happen to do a lot of purchasing on Amazon and you want to donate through that, that's a, a reasonably effective way to do it. Okay, good point. And actually, that's more than we get on interest income now, isn't it? <laughs> By a long shot. Yeah. All right. So wrapping up, uh, just summarizing everything that we went through in these, oh my God, two hours. I apologize for that. So, you know, the monthly meetings, we have the guest lectures. So there's a lot of things you can get out of the club, the uh, the society, uh, you know, and then no matter what your interests are within it. So, you know, participate in the monthly meetings, the SIGs, the star parties, work with and use the observing facilities, read the Gemini, the Astronomy League, get discounts, loaner scopes. Um, you can, if you want to sell or buy something, we have that marketplace and exchange form on the discussion form. Um, and then participate in the annual event. So a lot of things going on in the uh, Minnesota Astronomical Society. I hope with that, I uh, didn't bore you completely to death and that you got some good information out of it. Um, I didn't hear too many questions other than the couple of things we talked about. So I'll open it up if there are any other questions that came up um, and we didn't talk about in the meantime. Hey, this is Craig. Thanks for uh, thanks for putting this on. This was really informative and helpful, uh, particularly as a as a new member. Uh, was just curious if this um, this uh, presentation deck uh, was available on the site uh, anywhere. It's not yet, but it will be. Uh, Mark's going to post it uh, within a day or two, probably, or well, within a week. I'll give him a little bit of time here, but it'll be posted as a PDF so you can get all of the information. And also, again, as we mentioned at the beginning, the recording that Mark made will be posted to YouTube. And if we can figure out how to edit the, the stuff, we can put in, you know, section markers. You don't have to listen to the whole thing to find one thing. All right. Sounds good. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you.